Uh, as was mentioned, I uh, am a clinical psychologist. I run a practice where I do work with a lot of uh, individuals who experience depression and anxiety and all sorts of uh, family issues. And um, one of the things that always comes across uh, differently when I work with people who are of faith uh, compared to people who don't know the Lord is that trust, that trust in the Lord. What's interesting, though, is oftentimes you can speak of trusting in God. You can speak of the sovereignty, his sovereignty, but we don't live as if we trust in God. We don't live as if we understand that he is sovereign and that he is in control. And so today, I wanna, I wanna talk about, this passage is rich and you can, every two verses you could preach a whole sermon on it. Uh, so it's gonna be kind of a quick review of sort of the main points of this scripture. But when I look at how we experience relationships, how we experience um, school, and just life in general. We live in a, in a world that is very focused on material things. That's the image um, that we constantly receive from a lot of different sources. And when we think of materialism, oftentimes we think of just sort of that focus on obtaining possessions or uh, money. But we understand it also to be a philosophy, a philosophy of life in which matter is the ultimate and final reality. And so when we are living as if the material things, the things that we can touch and feel are the most important, there's no way that we can demonstrate our trust in the Lord. There's no way we can demonstrate his sovereignty uh, when we're focused solely on the here and now and what I can touch and what I can feel. What I find is that most young people, people in general, but specifically young people your age, what they worry about is relationships. Will I find the one? I've taught uh, one undergrad class for 11 years each semester. And we have these great discussions on what it means to be a godly husband, what it means to be a godly wife. I hear all about the ring by spring and the pressure you guys feel with that. Um, I find that a very interesting um, concept. Um, but that's what causes a lot of anxiety for a lot of young people. The pressure to find the one. The pressure to make the one that I'm dating the one. Somehow, I need to find that person in order to go on to the next step of my life. School is a huge anxiety-provoking situation, my grades, going home to family, as was mentioned. Family can be a source of anxiety um, for a lot of different reasons. But to really fully understand, let me turn this thing on, uh, the verses that were read, let's see. I didn't put the full verse up here, but we really need to understand the context of this peace in righteousness that brings us just that focus, having that focus on the Lord that will bring us that peace. And the first part of Matthew uh, in chapter 5, the last half of the chapter, talks about the nature of righteousness needed. 
Our righteousness needs to be the product of internal and genuine relationship with dependence on God. So the first half of the, or pardon me, the last half of the chapter talks about what kind of righteousness is needed. That it needs to stem from our personal relationship with the Lord and seeking that relationship with him. And it comes from within, not from external sources. And then, oops, pardon me. The practice of righteousness is in the first half of chapter six, where we're supposed to do things unto the Lord and not unto man. Everything we do in practicing righteousness is to be done to please God and to please and honor and glorify him as a witness and ambassador for him. And that's covered in that first section of chapter six. We are looking on the, in the, on the last half of chapter six, which is the perspective of righteousness. And much like in psychology and therapy, perspective is central to how you feel. Perspective dictates how I think about things, how I feel about things, and then how I act. Perspective is everything, and it's no different for the believer. So when we look at the perspective, our perspective and what we value is evidence by whether we pursue God's kingdom and righteousness or whether we're pursuing wealth and possessions. And when I say wealth and possessions, I'm also talking about even relationships, careers, uh, family, so it's not just about money. It's about anything that takes our focus off of God. So when we think about the passage that was read to us, what does it tell us about finding that peace in this age of anxiety? The reality is that technology is wonderful, isn't it? But I've had so many young people tell me, oh my gosh, three of my friends just got engaged. Why? It's all over fo Facebook, it's all over Twitter, Snapchat, whatever else you guys use. I only use Facebook, but I know that's for old people now. It's at least what my daughter tells me. And, but it's everywhere. You can't get away from it. And what is a tendency, our human nature, our tendency is to compare ourselves to the next person. And if I'm not at that stage, if I haven't been engaged, if I haven't figured out what I'm supposed to do as a career, if I haven't got a job after I graduate, then I feel like I'm lacking something. And that's a common source of anxiety for people. When we start comparing ourselves to others, and again, it's a matter of perspective. So the scripture tells us in verse 19 and 21, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So, the first solution is to do a transfer. Like we transfer from one account to another. Transfer your treasures to where they belong. Transfer your treasures to where no one and nothing can take them from you. Scripture talks about the more we treasure earthly things, the more we worry about losing those things. Relationships end, jobs end, school ends, money comes and goes. But our heavenly treasures 
are secure. And of course, in the scripture, uh, they use those three examples to demonstrate how transient this life is, how uncertain this life is. What do they say? The only thing certain is death and taxes, right? That's the only thing certain about this, this world. So you need to refocus on what actually is of value. We uh, put so much value on our things sometimes. Uh, my son had an iPhone 6, and guess what happened when he, the iPhone 7 came out? He became unsatisfied. And within the month, he had his iPhone 7, which is exactly the same, by the way, as the iPhone 6. But it, it just make, it produces discontentment. When you start comparing what others have or the newest thing, the newest gadget. This iPhone 6 that costs, I don't know, I think it's like $600, all of a sudden loses its value. It's no longer valuable when there's a newer version. And, and that's how pretty much life in general is, right? So Proverbs 23, 4 through 5 tells us, do not wear yourself out to get rich. Do not trust your own cleverness. Cast but a glance at riches, and they are gone, for they will surely sprout wings and fly off to the sky like an eagle. They're temporary. So laying up your treasures in heaven means we recognize the brevity of life and that we are here as temporary residents on special assignment for the Lord. I don't know about you, but I often forget that my life is not my own. That is a hard thing to kind of keep in mind. I get so wrapped up on uh, what I have to do and, you know, ministry and work and home that I forget everything I do needs to be done for the Lord. My life does not belong to me. It's sort of like a secret agent forgetting their assignment, forgetting the mission. The military is very big on the mission. And much like us as believers, we talk about the mission a lot. Imagine a sol soldier forgetting what the mission is. Everybody has a particular task or job to make sure that that mission is accomplished. The question is, do you know what your job is to fulfill that mission? Do you remember to stay focused on that mission? And that nothing is more important than that mission. I don't know about you, but I forget. I have to constantly remind myself that my marriage isn't even about me. My ministry is not about me. I adore and love my husband, and he is an amazing, amazing man, a godly man. But we both recognized that our marriage isn't just about us. And yes, it brings great joy to me to be married to him. But the primary focus, for example, in our marriage needs to be how is it honoring God? How is it testifying to the gospel? And when we get wrapped up in looking at our relationships as all about me and what I want and be, I want to be happy, then we lose, we're losing our focus. We lose our focus. So faith um, in the reality and promises of heaven, to have faith in heaven and to live like it. 
do you know that you're a temporary here? That this is your temporary residence? Do you know that you're already living eternally? And what your final destination is? To use God, the, your God-given potential as a good steward of the grace of God. Your time, your talents, your relationships, and anything, any treasure that the Lord has blessed you with. They're to be used to glorify God. That has to be the focus. We need to focus on our Father. In verse 24, it says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will devote to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. What we value and the choices we make reveals what our focus is. We either have clear vision or we have dark vision is what scripture says. In verse 22, the eye is a lamp of the body. So then if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. In the, if then the light that is in, your, is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? Here God is identifying what causes it even propels us to that place of worry and fear. This is where we understand that our focus, if we are being torn in two different directions, because we're believers and we believe that God has us here for a purpose. And, and I want to focus on this. But then this keeps distracting me. The things of this world keep distracting me. Then I'm, one of two things is going to happen. I'm either going to be focused on the wrong thing or I'm going to try to stay focused on two separate things taking me in two separate directions. And either of those things are going to cause me a lot of fear, anxiety, and worry. If your vision is clear, then our lives will be full of light. And this is where we know we can pursue, we, we will actually desire and have the will to seek God's righteousness and his kingdom. And if our vision is bad, then it's going to be full of darkness. And it's very difficult to fulfill God's purpose when you can't see when you're not even looking for it, when you're too focused on what's important to you in, on earth here. We're going to be going in two separate directions. The third thing is know your value. Here Jesus is teaching us that our Heavenly Father will provide for us because of the infinite value that he places on us. He is our Heavenly Father who intimately loves us, and knows us. God created us to be fully known and to be fully loved, meaning that God loves us in spite of ourselves. In, sp in spite of the, the ugliness in our hearts, the sin in our hearts, God loves us, and he values us. We are important to him. This is probably one of the biggest things that I have to work with uh, the hardest, I think, in working with individuals is that they don't understand their value. They devalue themselves. And therefore, life is overwhelming. There, there's no confidence in who they are. They live their life trying to seek approval from others, trying to be loved and accepted by others. And that becomes their primary focus because they don't understand their value in Christ. And this anxiety stems from that lack of faith in the value that God has for you and in his trustworthiness. 
God loves us so much, but we say we trust God and his sovereignty, and then we live like he doesn't even exist sometimes. When I was a student here at Rosemead, I was already an older adult, um, I was sitting in class. My daughter was probably about seven years old. I was a single mom at the time. And I was sitting in class, I was about four years into the Lord, that I had known the Lord. I was very excited to be here at Abiola. And um, I couldn't focus on class because all I could think about was, you know, I don't have anything in the refrigerator at home. I can't think of anything I can make my daughter to eat when I get home. And now, I knew I wasn't going to starve because I have a lot of family. But there was this anxiety that started building up, and shame, actually. Because I felt that I was failing as a mother. And I just, it consumed me. It consumed me throughout that class. There's a lot of stories where I could share with you that what, where God has provided. But this story in particular, because it was such a basic need, and because of my reaction. See, I didn't pray and ask God, God, you know, I need, I need you to provide. My anxiety consumed me. And all I did was worry and feel shame. So I get home, I went to pick up my daughter from school, and I, by this time I had figured, well, I'll go to my mom's and have some dinner and maybe shop in her pantry for a little bit till my next paycheck. I get home and I walk in and on my table are three bags of groceries. And my refrigerator has milk and eggs and all sorts of stuff in there. And I just started crying. And I felt a lot of things. Um, grateful, I felt ashamed that I hadn't trusted that the Lord would provide. My mom, who was not a believer at the time, had been prompted by the Spirit, she didn't realize it, I did tell her, um, to go to the store and buy me groceries. Now, mind you, my mother had never done that before, and she never did it since. Yeah, wow, is right. That's why it was such a powerful experience and the Lord said, I got you. I got you. That experience was just so amazing that it left a, a permanent, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Perspective, I guess. It, it shifted my perspective. I thought praying for food was just too minimal. Like those are details that, you know, God basically expects me to figure out. And he showed me no. Even when I didn't pray to him, even when I didn't ask for it, he provided. And it was a very powerful experience. Um, and so knowing our value Finally, prioritizing God's promises. How do we fulfill, find contentment, is to focus on God's kingdom, to focus on being righteous. Scripture is very clear that we are supposed to seek righteousness Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. I got married at 43. I didn't think I'd ever get married. And the pressure to be married as a Christian Latina woman 
was pretty, pretty strong. At some point along the line in those years of being single, I learned that I needed to find contentment and be seeking to be the, God, the person that God created me to be. That I needed to seek godliness, I needed to seek righteousness first and stop worrying about everything else. And you know what, if God has me single the rest of my life, I got to a place, and it wasn't easy, guys, it was not easy, but I did get to a place where I said, okay, okay, God, I can do it. And then he blessed me with my husband, who was so far beyond what I ever anticipated. So just to wrap things up, now that I'm out of time here, I want to leave you with this verse. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of the gospel, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is good of repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things, the things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. Practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Biola University prepares Christians to think biblically about everything, from science to business to education and the arts. Learn more at biola.edu.